if you'd like to put a, uh, a title on your message, I've titled today's message, uh, The Family Story Continues. Uh, and this is just going to continue to move forward here. And so let's open up in a brief word of prayer, and then, uh, then we'll get after it here. And so, Father, we look to you by faith right now, and, and we make requests that you would send your Holy Spirit to teach us, uh, for you are our teacher, Holy Spirit. So lead us and guide us into all truth. Minister to us those individually, those things that you, you're desiring to speak to us tonight. And um, uh, we just entrust ourselves to you by faith. And we do this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said. Well, the family story continues. Uh, you have a story within your family. Uh, here you are, you're sitting, however old you are, whether you're young or old, whether you're 20 or 100, you're, you're here tonight. And, and whatever your family story is, whatever you come into tonight with, you know, to sit in this sanctuary, to listen to this service, you have a collection of good, you have a collection of bad. You've got struggles, you've got pain, you've got setbacks. You have all of those things, all the very real things that we see in very real characters contained within the scripture. And I love that God does that from the beginning all the way through the end, that he reveals to us real people. He's not showing us people that are just, you know, um, uh, you know that, 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 well, they have it all together and they have just this perfect life. No, he's revealing to us real people. And so in this family story, uh, I want us to remember one more time because I'm trying to sow into your life that there is that greater understanding to take the narrative of the scriptures and not just get so you know, so deep into these concepts where it means nothing to you. I want you to understand the big narrative within the scriptures as, as it's pointing to the work that God is doing to redeem man. And as we, as we go through this, that big flow of Genesis, remember with me, I think I mentioned this last week, that there is a specific plan that is unfolding here and this portion of scripture that we're in, this portion of Genesis that we're in, there are very specific characters that God is using. He has a specific plan, and it's been narrowed down, and it's narrowed down, and it just moves from one generation to the next generation until it comes to the fulfillment of the things in which he is, he is doing. And, and, and we have the wonderful blessing of seeing, uh, you know, just in snapshots here in the Old Testament, things that take place in whether it's 10 years or 100 years or looking back over thousands of years, you and I can read through this stuff just like, boom, like that. And, and, and we could miss all of the fragrance that is in there. And so, uh, if you remember, um, do you remember the particular patriarchs that we're dealing with from Genesis 12, where Abraham comes on the scene, all the way through the end of the book of, of Genesis? Anybody remember what those are? Who they are, I should say, the four guys. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's it. Did you hear him? Uh, maybe it's on the screen here. Uh, maybe that's the cheater point. That worked out pretty hard. That was a tough question right there. <laughs> Ask the question and put it on the screen. You did it beforehand. Okay. Well, credit to Doug. He getting, it's, just, it's not a brownies class, but we'll clap for you anyway. <laughs> Good job, Doug. <laughs> so, so these are the guys. You know, this is, this is the line that we're moving through. This family story as it's, it's woven in the book of Genesis. And so... Uh, again, as we continue on with this in today's study, uh, well, you know, we, we, we start with maybe the death of Abraham, and then we see the birth of, of uh, Isaac's two sons, uh, Esau and Jacob, you know, these guys coming on the scenes. And, 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 and really, there's only one big idea that I'm going to stick with tonight in this chapter. And, you know, it, it could go fast. It could go slow. I don't know. I always like to say I'm going to finish earlier on time, and that never happens. But you never know. Tonight could be a first. And so what's the main idea that we're summarizing tonight? Well, it is, is summarizing the changes, the, the, that we're seeing that there's these changes that are set right before us. And we get the introduction to, you know, a collection. We've got Abraham, we've got Isaac, we've got Jacob. We've got three guys right on the scene here tonight. Although it, it is contained within several years, we see the fragrance that is woven within here. So look with me, Genesis 25, picking up in verse number one, here's what it says. It says that Abraham, again, he took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Ashua. And then it goes on down to name the sons that those kids have. And so if, 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 if we can understand this just in part, again, we're just moving through the narrative here. Uh, we saw that, that, that last, uh, last week in chapter 24 that uh, Abraham sought a bride 
for Isaac, so Rebecca, uh, you know, and he was, you know, 38 years old or so, and she was probably 14 years old, so there was a, a great distance between the two of them. Uh, and then in the chapter before that, we saw that Sarah had died, Abraham's wife. And so as, as all of this family stuff is going on, as, and, and, and as the family story continues on here, we come here to this next phase or this final phase of Abraham's life. And with the backtracking in chapter 25 here, we pick up a few more of those, those details of what took place after Sarah died. And so that's what one to four represents, these, these first four verses here. And, and maybe, maybe you like to strike down these interesting notes, so you, again, so you can get the context here. Listen, Abraham lived like 38 years longer after Sarah died, after he buried her. And so in the course of that 38 years, he ends up getting married, and, and, and he married to this woman, uh, what's her name, Keturah. He, this is the woman that he married. Okay, it, it, uh, you know, what does it say? It says that he took a wife. Now, um, depending upon what your Bible translation is, you will find wife, you will find concubine, um, you will find a mixture of things that are laid out within uh, your English Bible. And quite frankly, there is a little bit of debate as to, you know, really what is the role that this woman had? I I is she a concubine that, that moved forward to those things to where she maybe took on some, some privileges as, as a, a, a wife status, if you will? Or, or was it merely just saying that that monogamous relationship with her to him, that, that, that that's why they called her wife? Either way, uh, we should understand that wife or concubine, there is some serious debate over this. Let's understand the difference, okay? Let's put a definition here on the screen for you. It is not my definition. This is from gotquestions.org. Pretty cool if you've never been to that site. It's a biblical site. And it says this, uh, that a concubine was a woman who willingly entered in to an exclusive relationship with a man for the purposes of meeting his sexual needs or providing children for him. The woman was often a slave or a single female without a male protector. A concubine did not have equal status as a wife, but unlike a prostitute, she was provided for and considered the sole property of the man. And so what are, what are we trying to say about this? Uh, no matter how you slice it, you should understand this. That, that with Abraham, he's in this place of the third relationship for having kids. For he had Sarah. Sarah was his wife, prized possession above everything else that happened. But Hagar got in there, right? Hagar came in. She was the, the Egyptian slave. And, you know, he ends up having uh, Ishmael through her. Uh, again, that was, a, that was a mistake that he made 10 years earlier uh, that turned into, uh, well, he sinned 10 years earlier, that turned in and it carried over and in everything that happened with Hagar, God still, God still, you know, protected Ishmael as the child. He still blessed Ishmael as a child. Uh, and, 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 and man, just on the back of that, I want to I wanna make sure that I'm making a statement to you guys as a fellowship, as a people of God. Because sometimes you will see, you know, that, 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 that maybe your kids, or maybe it was you, you know, maybe, maybe you've, you've had a, a child at a, at a wedlock and all of that stuff. Please understand that the Bible is not making a distinction. Listen, the blessing of children are the blessing of children. It is never a child's fault. And so, you know, coming to this place of, of you know, uh, exercising abortion, which is super big right now, especially with our young generation, uh, that's not the option. Uh, a human life is a human life, and God cares about every human life. And, and, and making that statement, I don't make it in a sterile way. I make it in a way that we can have care and that we can understand as we're reading the scriptures, we're reading about real people, real people and real kids that were coming out of this. And so uh, Abraham, again, three different relationships, Shara, uh, uh, Sarah, Hagar, and then now Keturah. So uh, again, just to remember those, Hagar, again, the Egyptian servant, she bore Ishmael. Sarah, next, she's the wife, holds wife status all the way to the end, and, 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 and she bears the, the promised son, Isaac. And then Keturah here, she blows them all up. You know, she ends up, you know, having six, six other sons here for Abraham. Now, let's just think about this for just a minute. Let's consider this, okay? Because I, I think that there's something crazy about this. How old is Abraham right now? He's 140 years old, right in that range. Absolutely. That is an active man right there. He's a busy guy. 
But, but I think there's something cool to check out uh, uh, from this. You know, I, I think there's a pow- powerful observation that we should make because of, of uh, just because how, how pronounced it is. I mean, this whole chapter just opens up with this, right? And so it's like right there. It's in our face. God's not hiding it. But man, the lasting effects from the hand of God. That, that, that if you remember what God did is he rolled back the time of, you know, the the. the, the degeneration within the body and at 100 years old God rolls that back for Abraham touches him in a special way you know all of a sudden you know Abraham's reproductive system bam he is he's he's on the go again if you will and 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 now uh, Sarah had died and and Abraham's 140 years old at this point and 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 he you know he has six more kids that's stinking wild but you know why I love it because he was touched by God to be able to do that. And here's why I love it. Because it, it reminds me about the gifts and the calling that God has put upon my life. And when God puts these gifts upon my life, as he has put within, you know, if you're a member of the body of Christ, if you're part of the body of Christ, if you're a Christian, that God has given you a gift, whether it's one or whether it's many. And, 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 and just because we can go through these seasons of change, these seasons of difficulty, seasons of setback, you know, all of these things, all of these circumstances that are just, they're just normal to our humanity, if you will, God doesn't retract his gifting from my life. There might be those times where, where, where I, need to, I need to take a seat, if you will, as God repairs the wounds within my heart or, or helps me to grow through, you know, some real problems and all that stuff. So, sure. But God is not taking away the gifting that he's giving. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a wonderful encouragement that is attached to that, that God's not going to give up on me, regardless of the season, regardless of the setback, regardless of the struggle that is there, that God is for me, and that is not going to change. Let's take a look on the screen for just a second. Romans chapter 11, um, verse number 28 and 29. I'm getting thumbs up, so it's going to work. Okay, good. It says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. Uh, Yet, they are still the people that he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now watch this next verse. It says, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. So Paul is mentioning that in the New Testament, right on the back door of the reference of speaking about the patriarchs, of speaking about Israel as, as, uh, uh, as a nation people, if you will. And, and, and even though that they've had all of these things in which they have wrestled with over the course of time, what Paul is magnifying here for the church in the New Testament from the book of Romans is that he's saying, listen, man, God's not going to give up on you either. And I, and, and I don't think that that message, uh, and I don't think that the drum around that message, I don't think that we can pound that enough because, man, how quickly are, do we fall underneath the condemnation of Satan? So fast. So fast he's able to condemn us. And so what is the point? The point is, is very simple, that I, can, can, that I can depend upon God's unchanging character. Now, the story advances ahead. Again, we're back in Genesis 25, picking up in verse number 5. It says that, that Abraham, that he gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts, notice the distinction, to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. And so, so if, you can, if you can get the picture of this, if you can understand what's going on. Up in verse number one, we see Keturah, Keturah is, is referenced as a wife. And, and then in verse number two, you see these six other sons that are born. We get down here in this area, you know, and, and Abraham knows he's coming down to his death time. You know, and everything that he had, he's going to entrust to Isaac. He's going to pass it off to Isaac. But verse six, what did he do with all of these other sons? Well, he gave them gifts. He didn't give them the inheritance. He knew that everything was to be given to Isaac, that the promise was in Isaac, that Isaac himself was, was a promise, but that the line of promise would continue on to work through Isaac. And all these other sons, while he gave them gifts, it was so skillful of what he did because he knew the propensity of these guys rising up to try to take out the chosen son, Isaac, literally, you know, to, to disrupt his life and or to take his life was there. And so, so Abraham says, man, I'm going to give them gifts. I'm going to bless them and I'm going to send them far away. And he sends them to the east to get, get, a, get them out of Dodge. But, but, but Isaac stays in Canaan. Isaac stays in the promised land. And so, um, you know, that's, that's, where the, uh, that's where the inheritance traveled down to. 
And uh, I want to read to you Genesis 17, verse 7 to 8. Again, we've already read it, but I just want you to understand in the flow that we're just building and documenting as the flow of the family keeps going. Here's what it says, Genesis 17, verse number 7 and 8. Remember what God said. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. Who is Isaac? He's a descendant of Abraham. Uh, And and he says, uh, your descendants after you, their generations, uh, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So, so without getting into all of the details there, please just understand that the line was identified, the promise was given, it moved from Abraham, it moved down to Isaac, and, and now Abraham's at the end of his life, and the fulfillment and the funneling of what God is doing, first through Abraham, and then picking up within Isaac, everything is coming down to Isaac. Isaac is picking up on those promises, picking up on that, 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 that number one spot there, if you will, and he's staying in the promised land. It's not Ishmael. Again, it came from Hagar, the work of the flesh. Nope, that's not the one that God identified. It's not the the six sons of Keturah. Nope, those are not the ones that God identified. The promised child, the one that is is gifted, called, anointed, and, 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 and that God is going to work through, it's Isaac. It's a very specific line. And so... Uh, as he works his way through this, well, we come on down now, and we see in verse number seven, it says that this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived. How old did he, he live to be? Was he young or old? 175 years old, man. That dude, he wore out his sandals, I guess. I don't know. That's straight up old, man. Anybody hear that age? Anybody here feel that age? <laughs> I don't think so. It says, and then Abraham breathed his last, and he died in a good old age, in case we, we wanted to know. It was a good old age. You know, the idea is, is that he had a full life. And the idea that, that in the fullness of that life is, is that, you know, he experienced the blessings of God. And I think that's something important for us to remember. You know, that, that, that we want to die a good old age. In other words, having lived a life well after God. That's the, that's the whole picture there. Yeah, he went to 175 years. I got no intention to go to 175 years. Uh, you know, if I make 75 years, well, that might be a plus, maybe. I don't know. I'm cranky enough now. I'm getting to 75. I might be a wee bit more cranky. We've had some good times, and maybe, it, you know, whatever the time comes that God brings. But, but, but I do want this, and that is, is I want to be a good old age. And again, one more time, just recognizing the goodness of God, that he lived in such a way that he enjoyed the goodness of God, and he came to this age. It says, and he was an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. And so the, the time has come for him. And, you know, when, when this takes place and he dies, we've got Isaac and Ishmael they bury him. Look ahead to verse number eight, nine. It says, and his sons, plural, Isaac and Ishmael, he's only recognizing two of them there, uh, buried him in the cave of, of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zorah the Hittite. Now, why do I share all that with you, all those names? What does it mean? Where did, where, where did he get buried? What's the name of the city he got buried in? You guys remember? Hebron, absolutely, that's it. So we got all those descriptive things there, but he's buried in Hebron, that's it. And, and you know, uh, again, I, I told you that when we go into the West Bank, you can go to the Tomb of the Patriarchs today, right here to this location, you know. Uh, the cave is not there because they put a shrine over the top of it, but you can go right to this location and, 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 and you know, and, and uh, see these tombs and everything there. So very fascinating there. And so uh, as the story moves forward, uh, you know, he's buried next to Sarah. Uh, verse 10, it says, The field which Abraham had purchased from the sons of Heth, there uh, Abraham was buried and Sarah, his wife. So Sarah retains that, that uh, position, that place of honor. He loved her. He cared for her. And regardless of what happened with Hagar and Keturah, his heart was, was here with Sarah. And that's where he was buried. And then it came to pass after the death of Abraham. And I want you to clue in on on verse number 11 because it gives us a micro detail of what lies ahead. One more time. It says that it came to pass after the death of Abraham 
that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at Ber Lahai Royai, or Roy, I guess is how you would say it. And so, so what, what do we know about that particular location? Well, I've got a note here within my Bible, and I want to I find it and read it to you here. Um, if I can find it fast enough, I'll read it to you here. If not, we might go without it. Uh, Bear Lahai uh, Roy. Okay, so literally, the well of him who lives and sees, or, or the well of the one who takes care of me. So as this is moving down, that, that Isaac is, you know, the work that God is doing is, is, is not being filtered through Abraham now. It's exclusively on Isaac. And, and, and Isaac is living in this place at this moment, right there before the well of the one who sees, the well of the one who takes care of him. In other words, he's living in the middle of, of the promise of being cared for by God. And I ask you the same question. You know, the safest place that you and I can be is right square in the middle of God's plan and in the middle of God's calling, in the middle of God's purpose. And, 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 and many times we find the disruptions within our life is because we're not in the middle of those plans. You know, and I, can, I, can, I can literally just kind of glance a room like this so nobody gets tipped off of who I'm looking at, but I can see that, that, that there are people, many people within this room, that God's got a good plan for your life, but you're really kind of more dragging your feet because you're not understanding the way that God works because you haven't recognized and you haven't been able to, to take those steps of faith to embrace the call upon your life so that you can continue to move forward. And, 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 and we find through the pages of the scripture that, that many well-intentioned men and women, followers of God, that, that men, they can vacillate one direction or the other direction and their life becomes one perpetual struggle for existence. And that's often a sign that, that, that you're just outside of the will of God, and you know within your heart of heart. You know that within your heart of heart, that God has a call upon your life, and you just haven't responded to that call. And you're trying to do every other thing underneath the sun to put and to establish a good life, and to do this, and to do that, and, and, and get everything set up rather than taking what Jesus has said. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and, and, and what would happen next? Anybody remember? All else would be added to you. Everything else will be taken care of. Isn't it amazing that when we're walking with the Lord and I'm, and I'm in step with what God is up to within my personal life, how he causes things to come together. And then when he tries me, then when he tests me, then when he allows me even to be sifted by Satan when those times come, that I pass those tests in a different way because I'm insulated in the hand of God. Because nothing comes to me apart from his, his, his perfect will, right? We've got that example in Job. Extreme example. Please don't use that example for your life. And, 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 and just, just realize that that's a radical example. But in a general capacity, the details of your life and my life, when I'm in the will of God and I'm walking in lockstep with what God has for me and what he's created me for, that, that, that my life becomes so much more easier. I'm not saying that there's not pressure. <laughs> I'm not saying that there's not responsibility. What I'm saying is, is that I'm not wrestling with my creator. And, and, and that is where much of the frustration within our life can come from. Uh, I think I had shared this. Uh, let me think. It was last night. I was teaching in the school of ministry last night. Uh, and I shared this with these guys. I said, you know, three years into being a Christian, I felt like God was, was tapping on my heart to go out and to, to become part of a, a church plant in Ohio. And just don't go to Ohio, by the way. That's not the place to go. It's, it's not cool. Um, but, but I could sense that so early on in my Christian walk. And there are parts of me that wonder from time to time, man, what if, what if I wouldn't have backed up? Because I, 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 I paused before the Lord there and, and I, I, I took a deeper path within law enforcement there. You know, I'm just barely 22, 23 years old, whatever. I'm so young. And I took a different path. I'm going, well, okay, I got to do these things. And, and, you know, at that time, it's like, well, we want to buy a condo. And we, we want to do all of these particular things. And, 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 and I tell you, as I look back now, I can see that the striving within what I was doing for work, that well, God was still with me. God still gave me success, if you will. But it was, it was this labored effort that I was walking through, and I could, I could sense that it was like, well, 
man, I just, I'm just not dialed into where God wants me to be, and I just deadened it more by working more, by trying to achieve more, by trying to accomplish more, and all those things. And, and, and I could never get ahead. Never. And I don't, man, I, I, I share my own pains and stuff, um, you know, not to, uh, you know, not, not to whip you guys like donkeys, but, but hopefully to prompt you and to allow you to maybe, maybe learn through some of the, the pitfalls that I have experienced along the way. And, 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 and we know that everything comes back to the faithfulness of God, for God does want to lead us. He wants to lay out those steps within our, our life, and, and God's plan was unfolding right here uh, with Isaac, and it was narrowing down. And he was at this, you know, he was, he's in this location here, uh, verse 11 at the end of it, Ber Lahai Roy, uh, he, he, he's right here, right before the one who cares for him. It, literally, the, you know, he's at the well of the one who cares for him, the well of the one who sees. And, 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 and God's favor was there. We're going to see next week in, in chapter 26 that he bolts from this place. And he did the same exact thing that his dad Abraham did. His dad Abraham did it a couple times. He departed out of the, that central core area of the will of God and and, um, well, he ends up getting rebuked just like his dad did by an unbeliever. It's very crazy to see how these things pass down within families, you know, that our, that our kids can, you know, you know we, 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 we teach our kids, we tell our kids, and, you know, all of these things. And what do our kids pick up on? The stuff that we do. And it's not really what we tell them, right? You know, some of that stuff gets in there. But, man, because they're watching, they learn vicariously by just, you know, watching what mom and dad does. And that's what they end up doing. They end up doing that type of stuff. And, and, and there's no different in this case right here. You know, that Isaac had picked up on some of those things. And, and again, we'll, we'll unfold that a little bit more next week. Um, but for the sake of time in, in here tonight, uh, let's advance the story. Come on down to verse number, uh, maybe I should give it to you here in 12. Let's go down to verse 12. So 12 through 18, what do we see here? Well, we've got the death of Abraham that's already happened. Now we're moving into this area where we see a brief genealogy of Ishmael. But Ishmael's going off the scene, okay? It's just giving us a little blip. The, the story thread is not tracking Ishmael. He's not the central character here, okay? But, but he is referenced here. And so verse 12 down through 18 or so, uh, we've got the death of Ishmael and, and kind of his impact and, and those that came from him and all of that. Uh, and, then we, and then we move beyond this. Uh, we get into chapter, uh, verse number 19 rather. And, and, and now, again, we're fully funneling our attention to Isaac, says this. It says that this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Now, Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, you know, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of, of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. So 40 years old is when he gets married, okay? And so uh, what happened there? Well, he took her as wife at 40 years old, but verse 21, it says, now, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. What we don't see here within this, or right within those verses, is that we don't see the expanse of time. So use your eyes, go all the way down to, to the end of verse number 26. And here's what we recognize. We recognize that there's a 20-year gap in that process. He took her at 40 years old. They tried to get pregnant and have children. She was barren. And notice the end of verse number 26 that Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them, when she bore Esau and Jacob, or Esau and Jacob, however you want to pronounce his name. So there was a 20-year process in there of them waiting on God, of them waiting to, you know, um, you know uh, Isaac knows that he's the man. He knows that it's coming from his dad and passing down to him, and he knows that that will continue on. He knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. But living in that, look at how long it took for God to answer that prayer. And then all of a sudden she gets pregnant, right? She's got these twins within her. Look at verse 22. It says, but the, the children, they struggled together within her. And she said, well, if all is well, why am I like this? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, very wise woman right there. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall serve the, the stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. And so you know what I love about this is, is, is that we see that, that they stayed consistent. They didn't try to augment a bringing forth children to continue the promise. Who tried to augment things? 
Abraham, right? You know, his dad tried to jump in. And so, you know, I, I'd love to say this. You know, Jody and I, we go back to the days in our, our high school sitting on the, uh, the grass in the, in the quad of our, the high school that we attended. We attended Bonavista Vista High School in, in uh, um, you know, Spring Valley, California. This is in San Diego, one of the little cities in San Diego. And we would sit out there on the quad. We'd sit out there on the, on the, the grass areas and all this stuff. And just very young, 14 and 15 years old, man. I, I don't even know why we were having these conversations as kids. But, but we say, hey, if we ever got married, you know, we're, we're never going to divorce. That's not going to be part of our vocabulary. I mean, we're saying these things as kids. And we literally would, uh, I just think it was just the slickness of me as a little kid. I'm talking about picket fences and all this stuff, pulling your ponytails and whatever. <laughs> you know, it, 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 was just, it was just that time, man. Here's, here's the point. I, I don't think I made the point. It, is that we were not going to follow the processes of our parents. Her parents, my parents, all, you know, both sides, multiple marriages. You know, we were all over the road with different things. And, uh, um, you know, God does something special. You know, I, uh, uh, before I attended, uh, 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 I call it your high school, because really you were the stabilizing force at that time as a kid. Um, man, I had gone to 14 schools prior to, to meeting her. And, and uh, when I met Jody, it was school 15, which I attended for sophomore, junior, in senior high. It was my longest place that I ever stayed at a school. I was a wreck. And so our conversations were, were about not following down those, those painful pitfalls in which we saw our parents do. Back to our story, that it, even though it was 20 years that she was in a place of being barren, they d- Isaac did not resort to following some of the bad practices that he saw that his dad do, you know, leaning away from the promise and trying to get it done himself. So that's a very, that's a huge plus. But we can also notice this, is, is that while the, uh, while the promise was coming, it was there, it happened, she ends up conceiving here, and then, and, then, and then what takes place on the inside of her, she's freaking out. Verse 22, it says, but the, but the children struggled. This, this literally means, uh, in Hebrew, it means to crush or to op- oppress. And so she knew, as, as, a, as a pregnant mom there, she knew, whatever's happening inside of my tummy, this is not right. And so she's inquiring of God for God to give her some insight in all this. And, and right here in the middle of, of walking out promises, as God would do that, as God would work, you know, God gives her this thing and, and he says, listen, he says, there's two nations inside of you. There's a war that is going on inside of your belly and it's going to continue when those kids get out and, and, and you know, move forward. And so what do we have? What are the nations that we have here? Well, we have Esau. Okay, so he is an Edom. He's the father of Edom or an Edomite, if you will. Um, you know, his, his name means Harry, and, and the, uh, the work that he ends up doing, he gives up his birthright for a thing of stew, a red stew, and so there's a play on that. He's an Edomite, whereas, whereas Jacob, on the other side, the other nation, two, two nations here, he's an Israelite, right? You know, he, 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 is the, he is the one that would be governed by God. He moves from this place of being a, a manipulative guy, a soft guy, but a manipulative guy, to, to having his name changed to Israel, which means governed by God. And so those are the two nations that are added inside of her, her belly there. And so um, I'd, love, I'd love to say this. Uh, I'd love to tell you that, you know, that, that right here in the middle of this plan, that the New Testament speaks to us in these areas. So let's see if we can take a look at the screen here together. Romans chapter 9, I think this is on the screen, uh, verse 10 down through 13. Let's see if we can cue that baby up here. Here's what it says. It says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, that's our story, it says, for the, ch- for the children not yet being bored nor having done any good or evil, stop right there and pay attention to what we're, what we're working through. That God has made a selection why those two kids are in the womb. Those kids are still in the belly right there, Esau and Jacob. And in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, Paul is magnifying something that impacts you and I right in this room right now. He says, one more time, for the children not yet being born, they hadn't done any, anything good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. Not of works, but of him who calls. It's God's selection. Is there another verse on that or is that it? It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. So God was calling out right there before the kids even popped out of the womb that what he was going to do. And now as as that was a selection process here regarding Jacob, 
there's a selection or process regarding you. Take your Bible, turn it to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. Uh, I don't want to put these on the screen. I want you to see them with your eyeballs. So Ephesians, it's in the New Testament there. So if you would go to the Gospels and you continue to work your way to the right, maybe you're going to turn a couple hundred pages or so, uh, you're going to get to the book of Ephesians. If you can find it, awesome. If you can't find it, I just more, it's probably more important that you catch the concepts of what we're looking at, and they'll throw a few notes on the screen here for you. And so, why God revealed his sovereignty in selecting Jacob, again, before the kids were out of the womb, God knows. He knows the beginning from the end. He's, our, he's had a plan from the foundation of the world, the sovereignty of God. He has, he has the right and the ability to choose with foreknowledge and, and, and know who's going to do what. And, and, and as we follow that concept, again, out of Romans and moving forward to another letter that Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, we come to this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. It says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So did you get that? There's another example of election right there that God, just, like, just as we see that he chose Jacob over Esau, we see right here that, that those that have responded to the message, to the gospel message, to the grace of God, that God has chosen before the foundation of the world. I am chosen before the foundation of the world. That God has done something. And you can apply that to yourself if, if you've responded to that grace of God. He moves on and he drops another word here. He says, having predestined us to adoption. Two more big words. So we've got election, we've got predestination, we've got adoption. Crazy things. I'll minimize them in a second. Um... Adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasures of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Um, can you throw this? Can you skip ahead in the notes and throw this up? Uh, the selection, the sacrifice, and the seal. Just write down below, below all of the theological terms there. If you'll just pop that on the screen for the folks to see. So in this portion of, of Ephesians chapter 1, again, we're, we're mirroring into the New Testament what God did back then, just in that selection process there, if you will. He chose. It, based on his foreknowledge, he chose. And that's God's prerogative to do that. And what we're reading in Ephesians chapter 1 here is, is in verses 3 through 6, we've got the selection of the Father that is being put and taught to the church. Uh, and I'm not going to magnify all the details here. I'm just going to give you a, uh, you know, a rough uh, overview of this. But just recognize that the Father, the Father selects. Secondly, as we go down, verses 7 down through 12, it says this. It says, in Him that we have redemption. In Jesus, we have redemption, redemption. Through His blood, the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of His grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have attained an inheritance being predestined, there it is again, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. What are you talking about, Jeff? Much more than what I'm going to explain to you tonight. I'm merely just going to tell you and draw you back to the understanding that the Father selects. He's the one that made the selection. The Son is the one that made the sacrifice, verse 7 to 12. And we are sealed by the Spirit, which is verse 13 and 14. It says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. God is going to keep you. God, the Father has selected you, the Son has sacrificed for you, and the Holy Spirit will keep you. You need to understand that so that you can recognize that your life is worth something, that, that, that intrinsically there is value there because of God, not because of what you do. Well, how does that drill down into a practical application? Every time you look in the mirror and you think you're not good enough, hello, right here. You realize that, that you are chosen by God. 
That God gave up his only begotten son uh, you know, to sacrifice for you. And that he's given to you the guarantee, the seal of his spirit, because you mean something to him. You're, you're worthy. And that impacts everything that we do. Listen, if you're a person that has negative self-esteem and, and all of these things, and you do something bad, and then you start beating yourself up for you know, hours on end or weeks, days on end or whatever it is, man, you've got to draw out of that and come back to the promises. As we're going through the book of Genesis right now, we're seeing that line of the promises being woven into the early scriptures from Abraham to Isaac, down to Jacob, all the way to Joseph. We'll get to him. But, but just recognize that there's real things that apply to our lives that we can understand. And so while God selected Jacob, he also has a plan for you and he has selected you in the beloved, in Christ. And he sealed you with his Holy Spirit. And, and what that means to you is, is that you can rest as a Christian, that you can be secure. In the same way that, that, that Isaac dealt, uh, he dwelt, he lived, he stayed there at that place of, of Bear uh, Lo, uh, Leroy. Well, I got to think and read it to you. Hey, he was at that place where God saw him, okay? <laughs> When he was in that spot, right, he was, he was dwelling there in that place where God was caring for him. Let me give it to you now so I don't feel as, uh, bear lahai roy. Okay, that right, right there, right? He's dwelling in that place. So the one who sees, the one who knows. And, and, and he was living in that place. God knew. And God was taking care of him. And, and he just was in that space. And so um, I, I would like to, I'd like to give this to you. Uh, they'll put it on the screen, the theological terms. You can just throw them all up there if they fit. Uh, but, but in Ephesians there, while it is a very mm, complex chapter, you know, feel free to, to, to uh, look at our archives on, on the teaching on Ephesians chapter one. Uh, and, and, and you may understand it a little bit better. Uh, but let me just give you the definition of the terms that are woven into those few verses right there so you can just get the significance of it without getting into all the gymnastics. The theological terms that are used is election. What does that mean? I'm chosen by God. That's all it means. I think we can understand it when we do it that way. Secondly, when it comes to predestination, it means to mark or determine beforehand. So, so in God's foreknowledge that he is able to do something, he's able to determine beforehand. We read that from the foundation of the world that we've been chosen in Christ. Wow, how in the world can that be? In other words, God already knows who's going to reject him and who's not going to reject him. He knows that. Uh, adoption, what is this all about? Well, this, this means that we, re we receive the position as a son of God in Christ. That's the adoption. I've been brought into God's family. Uh, what about regeneration? Well, you know, a a regeneration is nothing more than as Christians, we receive the nature of a child of God, that there is a desire within us to will and to do for God's good pleasure as God's Holy Spirit works in us. And then redemption. What's that all about? Well, uh, very simple. That, that I'm freed from the guilt of my sin. Past, present, future. I'm freed from that redemption. In that redemption, I'm freed from that guilt. And so there are some very real implications and applications of understanding what we're reading in the Old Testament. And maybe I was expounded upon for the church in the New Testament and the applications that spill out of this thing. And so we finish our study now. Uh, by flipping back to Genesis 25, and we finish it this way, that in these last verses, 27 through the end of the chapter there, verse 34 or so, we find that all of a sudden that you and I are going to be led in to the reality of what type of heart that uh, these two guys have, you know, two, two nations that were in the, the belly of Rebekah, Esau and Jacob here. We're going to see this. But we're going to see that, 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 that God works something out, but not before we see the cell of a birthright. Verse 27, it says that the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter. He was a man of the field, but Jacob, he was a mild man. He was dwelling in tents, and Isaac loved Esau uh, because he ate of his game. But Rebekah, she loved Jacob. Now, Jacob, he cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that, that same red stew. This is where we get Edomite or Edom from, right there. He says, for I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. 
So what is this birthright to me? Now you should know this, that in the Hebrew, it, 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 it's not as dramatic as what it, we, were, we like read that here. It's like, oh my gosh, this guy's breathing his last breath and he's just, he's just trying to stay alive. No, that's not really what he says. The, the idea is, is that, that I'm, going to God, I'm going to die one day, so who cares? That, that's basically what the idea is. He, he didn't care. You know, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you've been this person or maybe you've interacted with people like this, that they have no care about their eternal state. Yeah, okay, you know, so what? I'm going to die one day. Yeah, everybody dies. You get that flavor? That's kind of what he's saying here. Moves on down, verse 33. It says, then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. And so he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and, and stew of lentils. And then he ate and drank and arose. And he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We have to understand this, that a birthright is a big deal. It's something that is sacred. And to give it up just like that is a big deal. And you can see this on the screen in part, uh, that, that some of the things that a birthright entailed in this time was that they were the head of the family. And, and, and they would have the ability to exercise priestly rights over the family. You know, just to speak to those that were younger, uh, you know, just, just about the uh, uh, eternal situation, about the things of God and all that. Second thing with the birthright. You know, normally the oldest son would get that and it, it would gain the family inheritance. That birthright would transfer to the oldest son. Uh, another thing that we see, and this gets a little bit more complex, so I need to be careful here. But, but under the Abrahamic line, that birthright of the oldest son, he carries that promise of being a blessing to the earth. Uh, that, that, that ties us back into Genesis chapter 12. Uh, and then the final thing perhaps we, we could mention here is being in the Abrahamic family uh, that, that he held in that continuation of the promise of, of, um, uh, of bringing forth the one who would bruise the head of the serpent out of Genesis 3 and 15. That's the Christ. That, that, that would transfer on down as the head of the family. But God didn't choose Esau. He chose Jacob because he knew that Jacob would despise this thing. And the point is this for you and I here tonight as we close with this. It's very simple. It said to give up a birthright, birthright for momentary gratification was a major disgrace. And, and you and I, if we cast off boundaries of right and wrong to enjoy sinful moments, we should understand that it will bring some lasting consequences into our life. Because every departure from faith, there is a scar to bear. And that's the picture of what happened here. And that's how you and I can apply this in a very, very, very simple way. Now, uh, I wrote a, a, a final closing verse down here. Uh, and it escapes my mind as to what the verse is. So I'm just going to read it to you. And let's see if something happens, if my brain kicks in. Let's throw it up on the screen. Hebrews 11. Here's what it says. It says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of, oh, here it is, instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. He had an eye upon what comes next. He didn't make a decision like Esau did and said, ah, I'm about to die or I'm going to die someday. Who cares? Who cares about this birthright thing? And so I want to encourage you just by remembering this, that there are boundaries of right and wrong. And there are, there are things that God has put into your plate. There are, there's, there, there, there's a calling that God has upon your life. And to despise that calling or to neglect that call, maybe it's like Esau just casting aside that birthright. For, for, for as, a, as a chosen son or daughter of God, he has given to you a gift. And that gift is to be used for God's glory. And if you sit on your hands and if you refuse to use that gift, then, 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 then you're in this place where you're, you're despising what God has given unto you because you're part of the body of Christ. Now, if you take that and you tie that into some of the regular uh, words of exhortation, words of encouragement, maybe words of correction, or even words of rebuke as to what you regularly hear in this fellowship, uh, you know, about those areas of submission. Get on board and, you know, participation and support. 
please understand that there is a real narrative flowing from the beginning to the end of the Bible that speaks to you and I as the church today. And, and there are things that we should take up because we have been brought in to the body of Christ and we shouldn't neglect the grace of God or the great salvation in which we have been given. And so a lot to say about that. That's just chapter 25 for right now. Uh, and I hope that you were able to, to see through and make the correlation between what was going on with the Old Testament patriarch and some of the inheritance that you have been given as a Christian in the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 1. Amen?